there we go. Well, uh, welcome to the second in the series of uh, Picture This. This time we're looking at Veronese painting of the marriage at Cana. Um, this, of course, is a series where we're looking at one uh, work of art and looking at it in great detail, trying to find the real meaning uh, behind the work of art um, by going through all of the elements that uh, were important for the construction uh, of this uh, particular picture, but which aren't really obvious to us today when we look at it. We, of course, look at it with the eyes of the 21st century and uh, things that seem to be very important to us weren't have been very important at the time. And so really, I suppose what I'm doing with this series is revealing new meanings and new interpretations for them. Now, um, I want to start with this uh, rather incongruous uh, image uh, of the Louvre. Now, um, going to the Louvre is really an Olympic sport uh, these days, as you can see, with the misfortune is that the marriage at Cana, as you can see ahead of you there, um, is in the same room as the Mona Lisa. And so everyone comes in to get a picture of the Mona Lisa. I have no idea why you have to have a, a, a snapshot of, of the most you know, well-known work of art in the, in the world. But as you can see, you cannot move. This means, of course, that uh, you cannot get to a decent distance from this very, very large painting um, on the opposite wall to the Mona Lisa. And in fact, you can't even get in front of it, as you can see here. Now, I'm showing you this because this um, is very important. Um, it means that uh, in many ways, people, when they do glance at it or if they are standing in front of it and look at it, see it you know, from a strange sort of viewpoint, but also see it really as just a conglomeration of very colourful figures. Uh, and then there's a bit of balustrade and there's a bit of sky. And it really looks like, uh, you know, a nice day or a nice feast uh, in Venice and in fact uh, miss the whole point of the painting. And one of the, the uh, things I want to emphasize in this lecture is that uh, when a painting is taken out of its physical context, uh, it means that the meaning of it in many ways is lost. And this could not be more uh, obvious, I suppose, in this particular case. So I want to actually look um, at the position, two, two things or three things about the positioning of this painting. First of all, we've spoken about not being able to get a decent distance from it uh, to be able to see it. But um, in particular, um, it is the removal from Venice itself and also, secondly, um, the removal from the refectory of the Black Benedictine Friars. And I'll be putting it to you today that, in fact, rather than just a jumble of uh, richly clad figures uh, in elegant poses, uh, the painting is a very clever uh, juxtaposition between the spiritual and the secular, uh, the elaborate uh, and the simple and the real uh, and the unreal. And the, the meaning of the painting um, comes at the juncture um, of these uh, two contrasting ideas. The first positioning of the painting, which is you know, something that's not at all obvious when it's sort of stuck on the wall of the Louvre. Uh, and by the way, it, it is there because Napoleon in uh, 1797, uh, in his taking of uh, Italy from the, from the Austrians, uh, arrived up onto the mainland opposite Venice and the Venetian uh, Doge summoned the, the council and half of them didn't even come. They just dissolved and disappeared. Napoleon didn't have to attack in any way to take over Venice. 
So he then um, took a number of artworks. Some people would have said looted. I mean, that's not a word I would have used, as you can imagine. Uh, and the amongst these was the marriage at Cana, which was brought back to the Louvre. When Napoleon was defeated, almost all the other works were given back to Venice, but the French government managed to negotiate um, another painting in exchange for the marriage of Cana. And so it remains in the Louvre. So in many ways, um, the painting in the Louvre, the fact that it's there, marks the end of the Venetian Republic, which had existed for a thousand years. So it, it, the connection with Venice is, is, is extremely profound from that point of view, but also from another point of view, um, as it is really about um, spirituality, as you'll see. And uh, Venice, of course, uh, spun these myths um, about herself. And one of them was that, that Venice had been founded on the 25th of March at 12 o'clock um, in 421 AD. And this, um, of course, the date, uh, 25th of March, was the day of the Annunciation. So in other words, Venice is positing itself as having a very special relation um, not just with the Virgin Mary, but with the conception of Christ. Um, and therefore, Venice being in the painting and the painting being in Venice was, was very, very different from the painting, for example, having been in Stockholm or somewhere else that didn't spin these myths. And I just wanted to show you, those of you who've been to Venice with me, um, will we'll know this very well, the Rialto Bridge, you have images of the um, Annunciation everywhere. You know, is Mary over here and Gabriel over here. Um, Veronese in particular will be the painter who um, foregrounds the idea of Venice's special connection uh, with the Virgin Mary. Here we have the city of Venice as a beautiful Venetian woman adoring the infant Jesus, but also um, there is a kind of osmosis really in many ways between Venice and the Virgin Mary and um, the uh, you, you, as you'll see in a moment uh, the paintings of the of Veronese often depict this but uh, the special going back to the special relationship between Venice and the Virgin Mary we have this at the particularly at the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, again painted by, by Veronese. This was an extremely important um, battle. Um, in many ways begins the sort of decline of Venice. I mean, Venice had already sort of started to enter a, a partial decline. This was a, a, a battle um, involving um, the Holy League, basically the Spain of Philip II, um, Pope... Um, the Pope and uh, the Venetians. Uh, the Venetians down here, of course, supplied the, the boats and the Navy, and it meant that they defeated the Ottomans uh, and actually stopped the advance of the Ottomans across Europe. So this was, you know, considered a great victory. And in Rome, you get, you know, the churches like St. Mary of the Victory, Santa Maria della Vittoria, and so on. <coughs> now, when um, Veronese um, depicts this, um, forget about the Spanish who basically provided all the money <coughs> and all the other people on the Venetian, on, on the Italian peninsula. It's just Venice, basically, uh, who is uh, showing uh, the victory to the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin Mary is opening up her arms to uh, Venice, who is seen as a woman um, with a dagger and supporting her are, of course, St. Mark with his lion, um, St. Rock, who's been stolen from the French, the Great Plague Saint, and St. Peter with his um, keys to heaven. So it, uh, down here you have the boats showing the importance of the uh, Venetian fleet. However, it was the last time that these uh, types of galleys, you know, using um, people rowing, great flat platforms of, of, you know, which really hadn't changed an awful lot from the time of the Romans. Um, after this, you will, um, the kind of fleets that are going to be used in line battles will be fleets that are more and more using uh, sails. So in many ways, it's the beginning of the decline of the great uh, manufacture um, dominance um, of Venice with their boats. So um, as I was talking about the sort of osmosis in, in art between the Virgin Mary and Venice here in the Frari, of course, 
you have this magnificent painting by Titian of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary. Here you have her, the, um, oh, sorry, I'll go back. The um, Virgin being lifted up on the, on the ground floor. You have the apostles gesturing. You have the uh, angels lifting her up and you have God the Father accepting her into heaven. Well, Veronese, when he actually paints the ceiling of the Doge's uh, palace, um, has a very similar structure. Down here, you have the Venetians looking up. You know, it's very similar. You've got um, the uh, city of Venice being pushed up, um, admired by other rulers on the clouds. Instead of God the Father, you have a, a personification of victory coming down to crown her. So particularly, the, you know, the um, English uh, grand tourists, when they came along, they actually thought it was the Virgin Mary. So the point I'm trying to make is this important connection between Venice and this painting that we have. Uh, and if you you have to actually factor that in very much in the interpretation um, of the uh, painting. The second element of placement that is extremely important um, is that it was commissioned by the monks um, of San Giorgio Maggiore, which we see across the lagoon from the Doge's palace. Uh, it was designed by Palladio. Um, this was a very wealthy uh, group of monks, the Black Benedictines. Um, they had very, very precious uh, uh, relics, particularly the, the relics of St. Stephen, you know, the first martyr. Uh, they were very prominent in festivities which glorified Venice. You know, this is Venice wears itself very much on the outside, you know, with its festivities and with its architecture, with, which you can see twice, you know, in the water and, um, and on, on the land. And they needed, they actually were a, um, a group who welcomed um, foreign visitors as well. Um, in fact, Venice, of course, was already um, a tourist hub, very much a tourist hub at this time that we um, are looking at. And um, they would come to, for, for the, uh, you know, the ceremonies that took place, also for the relics, but also to hear these the girls sing, uh, as we will see at the end of the lecture. So the refractory um, of San Giorgio Maggiore was designed by Palladio. And so you have this very, very tight um, collaboration between um, an architect and an artist. So the, the painting um, was fitted into the already existing or it was being designed more or less at the same time so that the elements of architecture um, are taken into account in the perspective um, structure of the painting. So it was meant to be behind the main uh, table where you would have the superiors sitting uh, and it sort of gave the um, other members um, of the monastery this sense that they were looking uh, into in infinity after in many ways actually having been able to contemplate and dwell upon uh, the ideas being put forth uh, in the painting. Now, um, the monks were silent during the time of their their meal. They they were not to speak, uh, even to ask for another piece of bread. They would have to motion with their hand. And Veronese, even at the entrance to this hall, had a big sign with angels holding up the thing saying silentium, you know, silence. So it's sort of counterintuitive, or it appears to be counterintuitive, that um, the scene which is painted is seems to be of people having an extraordinarily rich meal and seem to be talking a lot and there seems to be a lot of music and there is a lot of bustle. Um, in fact, it's totally the opposite of, of what was happening for the monks. As we'll see, that that is a part of the point of the painting. Now, the monks um, were very wealthy and um, gave the commission to Veronese, uh, saying that they wanted as many figures in it as would be possible. 
uh, and that they wanted the very most expensive pigments. This would have meant, as Venice was at the crossroads between East and West, uh, all of these wonderful pigments that were, could be brought in, particularly lapis lazuli, which is a blue, which they wanted that ground very much. This was a sign um, of wealth. Um, the gold often was um, from, uh, the uh, red was often from gold and so on. So you then would have this um, painting, which was set up like this. Um, one thing that has, has happened, I mean, it, it doesn't exist here anymore, but for the 209th Venice Biennale, um, Greenaway, who has actually done this with the uh, Last Supper, um, managed to con reconstruct the painting and project it um, onto the wall so that you would have had an idea as to what it would have looked like um, had you been um, a monk at, or a visitor at the time. And that's the other important thing. It wasn't just the monks who were there, but visitors. And they would have been the people who would have been identifying with the um, elegant, sophisticated people in the foreground of the feast. The other thing is that to remember is that the monks didn't just live on bread and water alone. The Benedictines um, ate very well and, ex in fact, extremely well. And, in fact, there are many um, things warning them of, of, you know, cutting back on their diet. So here we have then this extraordinary painting, um, which is um, about the marriage at Cana. And this again had been dictated by the Benedictines. Uh, and we're going to look at the importance of banquet scenes uh, later on. However, the marriage of Cana appears in uh, John in chapter two, and it's one of Jesus' first uh, miracles. Uh, he's, he will be with his, his mother, Mary, uh, and uh, they run out of wine. And so Mary says, well, you know, let's do, can't you do something about it, son? And he then changes the water into wine. And of course, the importance of these, this particular banquet is that you have the reference to wine, um, referencing, it's a kind of pre-Eucharistic um, idea, um, because the Last Supper, of course, will be where he takes the, the wine and says that it is his blood. And then they have the whole mystery of the Eucharist. So this was a kind of a banquet which prefigures all of this idea. Now, um, why did the monks choose um, uh, Veronese? Well, Veronese um, was part of this group of painters in, in Venice. Uh, uh, you have, um, he was born in Verona, which is why he's called Veronese. Um, in fact, his uh, father was uh, someone who worked in stone. And at the time, you usually took the name um, of your father's profession. And so uh, he would have been Paolo Spezzapreda, but he quite early on uh, showed great uh, talent uh, and decided to take the name of his mother, and his mother had been the illegitimate child of a local nobleman, Cagliari, and so he became Paolo Cagliari. This is what he painted under um, most of the time. Um, he was called Veronese for a short time, well, later on in art history, because there was another person from Verona, and so you have Paolo Veronese as opposed to Alessandro Veronese. Um, you just need to think of Caravaggio. He, he was, that wasn't his name at all. It was Michelangelo Merisi, but he came from Caravaggio. So that's how we, we know him. Now, he, as I said, he was one of a, a group of, of painters. The Venetian painters were known for their use of colour, their use of, of pig, wonderful pigments uh, that you actually could um, obtain, particularly in, in, in Venice um, because of its, you know, position as a trading and merchant nation. But um, Titian was really a generation older um, and is known for his psychological also insight as well as his colouring. But um, you will see very much uh, the influence of Titian, particularly in the portraits. Now, the thing about Titian was that he lived until he was 87 and even then only died because of the plague, which is really quite extraordinary from the time. When you think of a time when there's no antibiotics or, 
antiseptics much either. I mean, you know, most I wouldn't have lasted beyond about the age of 10, I think. But we then have um, the next painter who was about 10 years older than um, uh, Veronese, who was Tintoretto, and they actually would often share um, uh, commissions, particularly when it came to repainting um, the Doge's Palace, uh, which was burnt down, Titian's paintings were destroyed, and so the people who were given the commission were Veronese and Tintoretto. And Tintoretto lives till he's 76, um, which again is a, is a ripe old age. And I'm mentioning these ages because Veronese dies when he's 60, and that, that's a considerable time, a, a length of time, to have your career um, shortened in when you're being compared with the other great painters um, of the time. So he started out in Verona. I want to do this fairly quickly. Um, he um, finally comes to Venice uh, because this is where all the great patrons were. He was given a, a, one of the great uh, families there, gave him a commission, the Giustiniani, and um, he was commissioned to uh, paint the and decorate the Church of St. Sebastian, you know, dedicated to the plague saint. And that was a, a real, really big commission. He's going to spend a lot of his life doing this, but he starts out with it. Um, because he was a, this was a plague saint, it was one of the big votive churches um, of Venice because, of course, the problems with the plague. And um, here in, in the central uh, nave, you have um, three um, um, paintings um, of the uh, legend or the triumph of Easter, of Esther, um, which I'm not going to go into. I just simply want to show you um, the fact that he would, would now be known for his ability to paint um, ceilings. And you see the most extraordinary foreshortening that you have here with the horses looking as though they're coming down um, into our picture plane. This fellow's knees coming down. You actually sort of almost put your arm up, sort of thinking, my God, he's going to to um, hit me. He sort of turned in a very strange contrabosto position. Um, all of this by now in 1556 is sort of the end of Renaissance, getting towards the end of Renaissance painting and the development of what is called mannerism, um, which is going to emphasize um, movement in particular, let, um, go away from the harmony of Renaissance paintings, uh, and in particular extraordinary elegant poses and almost performance-like structures of, of poses. So he develops a name for his paintings and also works for the first time in 1560 with Palladio, who is, of course, the great um, architect around Vicenza, um, around Verona and around the Veneto region. Uh, and this is, will be the reason he will be given the commission uh, at San Giorgio Maggiore, because um, the architect will be Palladio. Uh, he, he decorates, he does fresco work at the Villa Barbaro. He then comes into uh, the time when the Doge's Palace is burnt. Uh, Veronese with Tintoretto it will be given the very choice commissions, and this is about as high a commission as you can get, is to um, paint the Doge's Palace and, and all of the symbolism of that. And so he's, here he is with these magnificent um, uh, ceiling portraits uh, that we, you look crane up and this is why it's in this particular form and of course here you have um, this is actually Venice whom you could of course mistake for the Virgin Mary all right and so this way in which you sort of move up this sotto in su up towards the, the um, figure of the Virgin um, covered in, in jewels as well which we'll talk about later. Um, this is what the Sala del Collegio, uh, Sala del, del Collegio in the Doge's Palace looks like. Um, all of these were done by a Veronese. I think most of you have been there with me. Um, one of them here again shows you the um, apotheosis, really, um, of Venice, uh, seated up there in ermine, um, adored by peace with the oval of branch and justice with her sword. They're all women, um, but again, this strong diagonal going up to um, a Venetian um, beauty, which you cannot mistake for being anything else but a Veronese figure. <laughs> Um, but again, sort of in the position that you, you could have had for the Virgin Mary. And again, here we have this apotheosis on that ceiling as well. 
Now, he was also um, became in great demand for his portraits, but in fact, he, um, the port his portraits are really a, a what are uh, in um, other museums around the world because, of course, they're portable, whereas um, most of his refractory pieces and um, ceiling pieces aren't. So, <clears throat> or frescoes, even though he didn't do very many after the um, Villa Barbaro. Um, the, the fact that he did so many is that um, in this particular painting um, is that we don't really know who it is and we don't even know when it's, uh, it was painted, but it is uh, certainly by uh, Veronese. You can see the influence um, of Titian, um, how it, but he lacks in many ways the sort of psychological um, depth, I think, um, of, of Titian, and there's more emphasis on the elegance um, of the figure, and very much an emphasis on material culture, and this is something that we're going to look at in particular. You know, there's a huge emphasis here on the richness of this ermine. I don't know how many animals were sacrificed for this um, particular coat, uh, and also the handkerchief, which was fine linen, the, the black um, also, which was, was was very expensive to wear. And then, of course, we also have the very recognisable Veronese woman. Um, here we have the, the idea of the story of Lucretia, who was the um, uh, was raped by the king of Rome, one of the Tarquinian kings, and kills herself rather than bring dishonour on her family. Well, of course, here she's, you know, it's just simply... Um, a pretext and the dagger's looking frightfully elegant um, and uh, it really is a pretext to show off um, Veronese's ability to um, create beautiful textures, textiles, look at look at all of the different textiles and the fabrics, um, this, the flesh of the woman and the jewellery as well and there as you can see she you know had been to a few feasts herself um, and, you know, being chubby at the time, of course, was um, a, a showing your rank, really. You wouldn't want to be thin. People would think you were a beggar or that you were uh, riddled with uh, pneumonia or syphilis or something like that. So being um, chunky uh, was considered um, beautiful. Um, he went on then to with many commissions, and I just wanted to show you this of this mannerism um, where St. Menace, you know, who's he? Well, I'm not really sure how he's what one of these typical Roman centurions who was supposed to have converted and therefore was martyred and so on. But here he is looking particularly jaunty in his armor um, and uh, striking a pose. And this is very much the mannerists, you know, the elegance of the pose coming out of the picture frame towards us uh, and looking very much not as though he's about to go to his martyrdom. Ernie's, after having done ceilings and, you know, continuing to do portraits, um, specialised also in banquet portraits. And um, there are five or six that we I could have shown you, but I need to keep this um, tighter. Um, the Feast in the House of Levy, which we're going to speak um, of uh, later on, um, that was painted because uh, Titian's painting in San Paolo, San, Gio San Giovanni San Paolo, was destroyed, and he produced this enormous painting, uh, and by 1573, uh, the um, Inquisition had gained power, and he will be hauled up before uh, the Inquisition, and we'll talk about that later. At the end of his life, he's, um, he actually, the uh, Counter-Reformation has come in and you can see very much the difference that this makes in the kind of painting which is going to be commissioned. Um, gone is this um, glorification of colour and, and uh, jewellery and, and all of this. Um, commissions now and the Counter-Reformation are emphasising the renewal of faith. Uh, and the importance of the sacraments. Uh, and so here you have St. Lucy, who's about to be um, blinded, I think, um, uh, shown uh, in very, very, well, everyone's in very, very dark colored uh, raiments, and she's being given um, the, the Eucharist um, before um, her martyrdom. So this was very much in line with church politics of the time. And you, the, the church, of course, is, is foregrounded here. Uh, this, this, and you actually have someone who is a martyr. 
Well, I want to now look at the, um, the painting and its structure and how um, the structure uh, shows you really what is going on. So I'll give you this, this view of this. We have um, the horizontals here with uh, Christ, which we'll look at in a moment. You have the important servants down here, uh, the musicians who we'll speak about. Then you have the lesser important servants up here. And in fact, I think there's about 130 figures that um, Veronese has managed to cram into this canvas. Now, I'm sorry that this is um, as fuzzy as it is. I've taken this from um, the internet from a a French uh, internet site, and I, I can't remember the name of it. I should be actually acknowledging it. Um, I just it was easier for me than for me to do it myself. This is to show you the way in which uh, it is divided. Now, first of all, obviously, as you have seen, you have this very, very strong horizontal um, reiterated across there as well. So you've got the heads of all of these people, for, including Christ, um, and this um, horizontal there as well. You also have very, very strong verticals um, relating to all the way across here to the uh, structures of the Palladian buildings, and you look into the distance into another strong vertical. Now, if you actually take the diagonals that go across from this, you will find that they meet here, uh, which is the, the moment when the servants come in and are actually chopping up um, an animal, which is certainly identified as being a lamb. And this is just above the head of Christ and above the head of, below the head of Christ is um, an hourglass. So I'd like to look at the next painting, uh, next image. Here we have Christ then, who um, is illuminated by his own light, all right? Otherwise, the light tends to come in from the right-hand side and illuminate the um, bride and groom who have been shifted to the left-hand side. So uh, although it's the marriage of Cana and you'd married a, with a marriage, you'd imagine that the bride and groom would be in the centre. Well, it's, it, he's not, it's Christ. And this, of course, is the message um, which the monks would be looking at. It is the figure of Christ. And he is the only person who is actually not speaking to or not looking towards anyone else. He is looking straight out at the viewers, at us, at the guests and at the monks. Now, above his head is um, the, the man who, um, as we'll see when we're talking about the protagonists, um, was um, a very skilled person and he is chopping up the lamb. So the lamb referring to the sacrifice um, of, of Christ. And below uh, Christ you have here who is very still, uh, with Mary actually um, making that gesture which is if to a wine glass, even though she's not saying anything, it's referenced to the fact she's um, asked her son to perform one of his miracles. So below him, directly below the sacrifice of the lamb, um, this figure of Christ who seems to know what is, is actually happening, is the wine, uh, the hourglass, um, symbol of vanitas, symbol um, of that all of the earthly, uh, worldly goings on, uh, you know, the brocade and the music and the chatter and the food and the jewelry is all really um, going to pass very soon. And the real message of the painting is through looking through, uh, being able to distinguish the real meaning of life beyond the ostentation um, of the everyday world. So uh, this is just another view, um, which is something that you just wouldn't see unless you actually look very, very closely to see this vanitas symbol. Of course, this was very prevalent in the time in, in Dutch painting, as we'll see uh, next week. So let's go back to the main painting uh, and look at how the painting is basically done in strips. Um, 
right on the bottom, you have everyone's feet and the animals, which we'll also talk about, um, the cat and these two dogs, um, another dog here, all these different feet, all these different types of shoes, um, but also the floor, which is going to give you um, move towards a vanishing point. Um, in the second level, you have the table um, going across and the heads of, of at least the, the foregrounds of the, the heads of the people in the foreground. The next strip is the foreground of the people in the background. And then you have a very large strip, which is looking um, at the uh, sky. The, the huge um, emphasis on the sky was, you know, is it, is it symbolic of going into heaven or was it simply, as some cynics have said, that um, the monks and Veronese were showing off how much um, uh, lapis lazuli he was using. Well, I now want to look then at, the, at another um, point here, which is another taken from the same French website, is this um, use of uh, vanishing points. Now he uses two vanishing points, the one which actually uh, they all coalesce here at the head of Christ, and that he uses that vanishing point for this part of the painting. And then he uses a vanishing point here for all of the rest of it. So that it, with, by the use of two vanishing points, which aren't obvious when you just, if you look at it close up, he's managed to incorporate all of this without sort of making it look as though it sort of bends or it's, it's actually too crowded. Now, going back to this then, um, uh, what am I looking at here? Um, I'm looking at, at, at Christ. All right, well, let's have a look at the protagonists. Um, on the main ver uh, horizontal, we have the what would be just above the horizontal uh, table of the superiors of the Benedictine monks. And one, the superior would be reading a lesson um, to the, the monks as they silently ate. So you would have uh, the monks table below. And then, of course, this is the real table um, in life, which is that um, of Christ and his apostles. So here you have Christ very, very still, the apostles near him. Um, and uh, you will see that they're dressed, uh, they're distinguished by a completely different type of, of dress. Here we have uh, the simplicity uh, and lack of modishness um, of their outfits. Uh, of course, the red and the blue, you know, symbolising the fact that he is red, he is part human and also part divine, uh, referencing, of course, the um, dogma, um, particularly of the, the Catholic Church at the time. So um, you will note and all the way through that actually no one is eating. Um, this is a feast, and that's why I've called it a feast for the eyes. Um, no one is doing anything as vulgar as really put anything in their mouth. And people, they are, it looks as though they're talking. Um, no one's mouths, however, are open. Um, it almost looks as though it's, even though it, it looks like a chattering scene, in fact, is there any sound really coming from their mouths at all? So therefore you have um, Christ in his own time frame in many ways, um, like an icon seated looking at us with his own, um, own uh, light source um, and his own uh, eternity. Now, on the other side, in contrast to this, of course, you have 17th century Venice. And uh, the banquet, as we'll look at in a, in a moment, the whole point of the banquet for the Venetians was to show off their um, ability to, uh, well, their, their rank um, and their wealth, uh, which was no different from anywhere else but they were able to show it off in a much more spectacular manner um, because they were Venetians and they had access to the latest in, the, in Eastern uh, textiles, jewelry, and even uh, manners, as we'll see um, in a moment. 
Well, who do we have here? Well, um, the majority of the people, of course, are going to be servants, but you have two different types of servants. Um, in the foreground here, you have the master of ceremonies, who is clearly a very important person by um, the way in which he is dressed uh, with his extraordinary green and this beautiful sort of uh, fabric. Um, his headdress, um, the beautiful instruments he has, of course, here. And he's the person who is going to be presenting the wine, which is water, which is changed into wine, to the bridegroom who has been moved to the left. So by having this person um, pointing, we have the idea that this is um, not Christ, who's, of course, the spiritual center, but the earthly center is the bridegroom here. Now, you will also notice that no, not too many people seem to know what's going on. I mean, they're much more interested in, in uh, looking at each other. Uh, so we have this person here. Now, the at the time, uh, there had been published a book by Baldassare Castiglione called, the, you know, the a book about the perfect uh, courtesan, uh, courtier, I should say. Uh, and this was a book of, of how to behave uh, in general, how to behave to um, work out deals, and in particular, how to behave um, at a, a banquet. Um, so this person would be a highly paid servant. Uh, and uh, he, it would be he who would have orchestrated everything. Now, you can see that he's in a very elegant sort of position uh, here. He's sort of gesturing uh, towards uh, the table. So who else do we have here? Um, we have the bridegroom. Uh, we will look at um, his dogs and things later, beautifully attired, his wife. Um, this, there, there are supposed to be um, Charles V. Um, this, I think, is, is supposed to be the King of France um, and maybe Eleanor of Austria. Um, we have one of the pashas from the uh, Turkish uh, kingdom, Suleiman the Magnificent, not sure who she is. Um, I think this is supposed to be a, one of the great poetesses who was also a courtesan. Um, down here, so you have reference to the great sort of courtesans and the great sort of um, poetry, I suppose, um, of Venice, but also the um, cosmopolitan nature of, of Venice, you know, with the different types of, of outfits uh, here, from the Turkish to the, to the Dalmatian, um, to, the, um, to these extraordinary outfits here. Now, the, um, we also have, oh, sorry, a reference, it's very touchy, a reference here to court culture. Um, all the courts of Europe had a dwarf. Um, they were prized possessions. And this one, of course, is very sultry looking. So this, this is sort of, again, these would have been, people would have been bought, I suppose. So therefore, it shows also the, the wealth, you know, of, of what of this bridegroom. So all of this is to really sort of show um, sort of the, the wealth of the person. You also have a little black um, page here, um, again, showing the cosmopolitan nature um, and gestures, uh, a, a court gesture, a jester here in the background. Now, on the other side, we have um, the moment of the miracle. Well, this is um, the, here you would have had the water, and here the water is being poured, and it's already had turned into wine. And again, no one seems particularly um, interested in this. Um, people are looking upwards. Here you have um, one of the great cardinals of the time. This is quite possibly Charles V, the great Habsburg uh, emperor. Um, and the person here, um, there is sort of some dispute as to who it is. It could have been um, Veronese's brother who actually works in his studio. But um, it is thought that this is Aretino, who was um, a great poet. In fact, he was a pornographic poet. And the reason he had to leave Florence was be, and at least Rome in particular, because he kept writing um, scurrilous um, poems and messages about the Pope. 
uh, and uh, he was a great friend um, of uh, Veronese and of this particular circle. So he there is the he is seen in the, the extraordinarily elegant pose. Do you see what I mean? An almost balletic pose, um, showing off um, his ability um, to balance this open cup cup bar is called, uh, with wine, um, which would have been watered down, but it's a very, very large open surface, and he's sort of showing the elegance of gestures, and this is what's so important um, at this um, banquet, that these were sophisticated people um, who, as we'll see, were using um, cutting-edge uh, table manners. <laughs> And above these people, we looked at the servants in the front, um, were this um, plethora, the, the, by far the most numerous people at the feast, who um, are the other servants. And again, you can see there are um, many dark-skinned people, um, people from the Middle East. Um, but this person here would be very important, even though he's not dressed in a very royal manner. He, um, the carver was one of these people who was very, very highly trained uh, and uh, was supposed to be able to cut and um, bring it down, uh, the meat down in a kind of cascade. So it was a performance. You know, the whole um, banquet was not just shoving a bit of meat on your plate. It was all about performance. And so the fact that you have this performance and the, and the chopping going up, up over the head of Christ is very important. So um, this then is, is the movement that he has managed to instill in this is quite important. So you have the stillness of Christ, whereas the flurry um, up here. Um, also in the centre, um, we'll talk about this when we talk about music, um, um, is that um, we have these musicians um, who are exemplary of what would have gone on at a banquet at the time. Um, he, these actually are the painters themselves. Um, we have uh, Veronese himself, who is on the viola da braccio. Uh, you have, um, this is, uh, just meant, this is uh, Titian over here in the Viola da Gamba. You have Bassano, who is another important uh, painter of the time, um, also here. No, this, sorry, this is Tintoretto over here, and this is Bassano here. And behind, you actually have another um, great uh, musician from the court of Naples. And in fact, there's someone here also with a trombone. So it, theoretically, it would have been a quite a noisy uh, a banquet, you know, with people, uh, I mean, actually with a kind of trombone as, as well as this. It wasn't just a few strings uh, as well. And uh, you would also have had people uh, singing. All right, so I now want to look at um, what they're eating and, and, um, and also the importance of um, banquet scenes. So um, the first kind of uh, banquet or paintings that would have occurred in uh, convents and monasteries uh, for the religious who were becoming more and more numerous, um, by the way, in, in Venice at this time, uh, as, as the Venetian nobility began to lose some of their wealth, they um, had to uh, send their daughters to, to convents uh, because they could really only, you know, they didn't have enough money for important dowries, even though you still had to pay a dowry if you entered one of the convents. So there are a number um, of, uh, you know, refractories which were being built around Venice, but also they were working within the um, tradition of, of, of Florence and, of course, of the great Renaissance painters. Um, so here we have Gerolandario, uh, who, and I think with the Last Supper, um, as you can see, it's an extremely static uh, painting. Now, um, originally, the first kinds of depictions that were in the refractories were those of the crucifixion. And by the time of the Renaissance, uh, it moved gradually to those of the Last Supper because it sort of uh, there was a connection between people eating and actually the greatest uh, you know meal uh, in the, the Christian Church. And so that was obviously a more appropriate um, image. 
um, but it was still then considered important um, as um, a means of meditation uh, on the, the meaning um, of, of the Eucharist, you know, um, the Last Supper, of course, with the bread, bread and the body and blood of Christ. So you go from the crucifixion, which it's not that it's considered too gruesome, but it just wasn't as appropriate as having another meal. And then, of course, you have um, the, the Leonardo's Last Supper, uh, which is, in, in, in comparison to the one that we're looking at, extremely sober uh, and linear, really. You see that with all of the hands moving towards Christ and, and so on, uh, which has been greatly just, um, restored to an extent where you wonder if you can call it Michelangelo. But it would have had a, a great effect um, on the treatment um, of uh, refractory paintings. So then um, in Venice in particular, you then um, move from um, overt um, depictions of the Eucharist onto, um, for example, the other feasts uh, and well, the Feast of Simon, the Feast and House of Levi, which are mentioned in the Bible. Um, and here we have Tintoretto's, you know, typical sort of mannerist zooming into the distance, um, again, um, of the pre-Eucharist of the turning of the water into wine. So in other words, these um, paintings of feasts are going to appear um, quite commonly um, in, um, in um, refractories. Now, um, I want to now then look at uh, how it is depicted here and how it, what is particularly Venetian um, about this uh, uh, painting. Now, um, I've, I've said before that the meaning of the painting is in the interaction between the spiritual and the um, secular. Uh, and we have what looks like um, great emphasis on consumer culture here. Um, let's have a look at what they're eating. Well. It is typically uh, the last uh, course uh, of a banquet. Um, and they are eating nuts, as you can see here, and quinces. Now, uh, if you actually look, there are a whole lot of treatises uh, being written at the time about eating. Um, sort of how to eat uh, and what to eat and uh, the effect of eating on health. You know, there were all of these um, performances, you know, which, which really the banquet was, um, are being written about. And Venice, of course, is a great center of uh, printing. Uh, and many people who've come up to Venice also um, escaping the, or trying to escape the counter-reformation um, movement uh, in Rome. So you have a sort of a, a blossoming of these writings, often um, relating to the ancient world, as we'll see when we're talking about jewellery. And um, so um, at the end of a meal, you were supposed to eat... Uh, fruit and, and nuts, and which was supposed to seal the stomach, uh, and also the, the best wine. So that's why it's at the last course uh, that you actually have the miracle happening and that this emphasis um, on the wine being shown um, to the uh, um, uh, bridegroom. Um, however, um, there's a, there's a real problem with the time sequencing here. I mean, a moment ago, we saw that just above Christ's head, you had the meat course being introduced and being cut up. So there is a, the, the synchronization of, of, of two elements of the painting don't work. Um, and this is because one is referring to the immortal time or, you know, eternal time of Christ and what you have on the table is the uh, everyday banquet or secular time um, of the meal. But there's more than that because the nut was seen as a symbol also of the Trinity. It has three layers. You have the, um, the shell, you have the meat and you have the seeds inside. 
And the quince also, although it, the quince was supposed to be also a reference to a fruit that you had at a marriage ceremony because it was slightly bitter and showing that it was bitterness as well as sweetness in marriage. And um, But also it had a biblical idea that um, if you actually broke off a branch of the, of the quince tree and planted it, um, it would uh, blossom. So uh, it referred to sort of, again, um, eternal life. So uh, this what's on the table is, is extremely important, as well as the, the blood, I suppose, of Christ, which is um, the, the wine. Now, it's not just what they're eating. It's the way in which they're, they're what, what they're eating with. Um, you will notice that, um, well, first of all, there are beautiful um, gold and silver platters. So this is referring to the wealth um, of Venice and also the wealth of the family, but in particular of Venice, its ability to attract and its great the fact that it was one of the great merchant empires of the time. Um, you also have knives and forks. Um, and the fork, of course, was a a revolutionary sort of um, implement, uh, which was brought across to Venice when um, a Venetian princess, uh, uh, a Byzantine princess married someone from the Venetian aristocracy. And it then goes into the French court and then at least into the um, Italian court um, and Mary de Medici brings it to, um, to France. So this was um, showing great sophistication uh, and the fact that each person has their own individual setting. Now, this, again, was something extraordinary because, of course, um, up until then, everyone used to um, use a central platter, uh, probably in England and, and, and France. They even, to some extent, were using bread as, as their trencher uh, and so on. So this is a very, very sophisticated um, feast, even though no one is eating. All right. No one is doing anything as vulgar as eating or even opening their mouths. And there's this sort of elegant display of gestures as well. So these are the perfect guests who know how to behave. And they also have napkins. You actually have beautiful Murano glass. Uh, with, you know, showing off the fact that this was uh, one of the specialties of Venice. Remember, if, if you were um, a Venetian artisan, you could not leave Murano. Um, you, you were given a death sentence, or if you were caught, you'd have your hat, one of your hands cut off. They wanted to keep um, the uh, the discovery of, of, of glass blowing and so, so on to, to Venice. Um, and of course, you have these beautiful um, cloths um, as well, uh, dining cloths. Um, so this then is is what the banquet is, is what they're eating. Um, uh, here again, you have um, well, what I'm referring to here, I suppose, is also the textiles. Uh, everyone is wearing. Um, beautiful silks or velvets in extraordinary colors. I mean, you know, this is a time, okay, for us, it's it's not amazing, but uh, when most people were getting around in, in drab sort of browns and dark grays and we're using vegetable dyes, here you have absolutely extraordinary cloths. Um, usually only the, you know, the royal courts would be able to afford this, whereas here you've got, you know, a, just a, mar a marriage feast um, who were dressed like this. And here, um, Aretino's um, drawing, uh, oh, sorry, his um, outfit is um, uh, referencing uh, marriage as well. You actually have a tulip underneath here, which is um, relates to, to marriage and prosperity and fertility. And above you have a wedding ring. So um, every everything in this particular painting um, has some meaning. Um, I just wanted to show also the fact that uh, anyone else might have just sort of painted a, a, va a vase, or a, but this one here is, is very elaborately um, designed, and I'm sure there's some kind of symbolism on this as well. Um, many other feasts were painted by um, uh, Veronese. I'm just Feast in the House of Simon. I just want to now quickly go to the Feast in the House of Levy. Um, I've only got half an hour. Um, um, when I think I told you that when the um, 
this was San Giovanni San Paolo, um, just not far from our hotel in Venice, um, when the, there was a fire and the Last Supper painted by um, Titian was burned. And so Veronese was commissioned to do another Last Supper. Um, he conceived it uh, again um, in the same manner as, as our painting, um, but this time it is the Last Supper and uh, you have exactly the same ideas in, in extraordinary architecture and, and a lot of um, people in the background. So here you have Christ um, speaking. Uh, you've actually got this dog sort of a rather interesting, you know, angle view here. You've got a lot of... Um, uh, animals. Uh, here you've got someone really tucking into his meal. I'm not sure this is, it's not St. Peter, I'm not sure, but you know, he's making sure he gets a, a nice big bit of, of meal. Um, you also have um, black uh, pages, dwarves, and, you know, someone picking his teeth, gra graceful gestures. You have the patron of this who's really rather fat and lumpy, and you have Germans who are getting drunk uh, on the side. Now, Oh, sorry. The um, Inquisition uh, was very upset by this. By now, the Inquisition had reached uh, Rome. You have the count uh, had reached Venice. The Counter Reformation was uh, in full swing, and uh, Veronese was called up before them and said, "What are these drunk Germans? What are these animals? Uh, what are these, you know, black pages? What's that got to do with our Lord's Supper?" And Veronese, there's actually the um, in the archives in 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 Venice, you can actually read uh, the uh, trial and and how Veronese um, answers back, you know, very in a very self self assured way, which you wouldn't have been able to do if you'd been in Rome, by the way. Um, the Inquisition uh, in Venice was much more lenient. And in the end, he sort of says, well, you know, that's us, this is what us, that's, we're like poets, us painters. And uh, more or less said, look, I'm not going to change it. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll change it and call it the Feast in the House of Levy. And there was an agreement that if the title was changed, uh, it was no longer considered sacrilegious. So it was embroidering at the edges. Um, I have a lot more to get through, so let's just quickly get into um, the other elements of material culture, which um, are foregrounded by Veronese. The first thing that strikes you here is the um, richness um, of the jewellery, uh, and particularly the jewellery of the women. Now, um, in uh, Venice at the time, there were sumptuary laws, and the sumptuary laws um, were based on the premise that uh, it was a stable kind of republic, but it was pyramidal. Uh, you had the doge at the top and you had the workers at the bottom. And uh, they had managed to preserve this more or less for almost a thousand years. Uh, and uh, however, as um, Venice's uh, power was beginning to shrink, uh, so was the wealth which was being distributed and there would be unrest amongst um, the population. So there were a number of laws showing that you couldn't be um, too ostentatious in the way in which you paraded your wealth. And this actually also related to the um, banquet, <clears throat> which I should have spoken about, this mediocritas. Um, you were at a banquet, you, were on, you weren't supposed to have fish courses, you weren't supposed to have more than one course of, of roast meat. Uh, and uh, this was for a major banquet. If it was just for a group of 20 people, you were allowed to have oysters, but not more than two each. Um, <clears throat> sounding a bit like COVID, basically, you know, very, very restrictive. Um, the fact that Veronese has actually shown a very, very restrained menu um, shows that he actually was obeying by these sumptuary laws, at least in what he was eating. Not the case with the women. <clears throat> now, the laws relating to jewellery um, related very much to um, pearls. Uh, pearls were seen as a symbol um, of Venice, Venice rising from the sea, and women were only supposed to wear one strand of pearls um, if they were a bride, and this was supposed to be given to them by their mother-in-law, um, and there were supposed to be no other pearls and no other jewels to be worn. Um, the fact that this had to, these um, sumptuary laws were constantly being updated about every 20 years shows that no one really took any notice of them at all, um, as you can see in this painting. 
Now, um, the sumptuary laws then began to sort of target false pearls as well, um, because Venice, of course, being the centre of glassware, was able to manufacture glass pearls, which they then they put fish scales in the centre and then wax into them to make them look as though they were real pearls. And so um, this system actually worked right down to the 19th century in, in France, you know, where you, if you, the Empress Eugenie actually, sometimes in one of her tiaras, you couldn't get an exact um, matching pearl, so you actually used a false one. Um, and so many of these maybe would have been false. But as you can see, this idea of no adornment um, is absolutely as being flouted completely. The other thing that's important here are these enormous brooches. Um, brooches were originally used to close a cloak, whereas now as people are no longer wearing cloaks, so, you know, they're wearing them, they have turned into brooches. Um, and what is it? Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, the uh, the um, jewels that you have here um, aren't cut. Uh, they're very, very large um, sapphires or um, emeralds, and um, they're called cabuchon. Um, and um, they're surrounded by very, very large uh, settings um, of gold. Um, the people sort of were able to cut, but um, this was considered more important as you could get a larger piece. And the black ones here could actually have been diamonds. The diamonds, um, uncut diamonds actually looked black. It's only when these were um, cut into brilliance that they actually take on the form that we know them nowadays. Um, I just want to show you here, this is in another, another one of his feast, um, uh, Feast of the House of Simon, these really beautiful hairdressers, uh, head, head outfits that the women have, um, foregrounding also Venetian blondes, uh, that was, was people, that, the women actually um, dyed their hair. Now, as this was a renaissance, um, as there was um, interest in reviving uh, treatises about uh, food and, and health, there was also great interest in reviving or looking back at the ancient uh, works on, on mineralogy and the real world. And uh, Agricola's uh, work was being published at the time, and people who had excess wealth and excess um, leisure um, were very interested in these new classifications of minerals that were classified into marbles and stone and, and gems and so on. And so people were not just interested in, in gems for jewellery, um, but also um, in collections. So people, you would go to someone's palazzo and there would be large uncut stones and there would be a discourse about um, the interest in these particular stones. Um, the stones were classified more or less the way we have it now with diamonds, then there was emeralds, no, then there was pearls, then there's emeralds and then rubies are quite far down the list and then really at the bottom there were sapphires. However, at this time, um, the trade routes were being opened up towards um, India. And so you're going to get an influx of uh, rubies and sapphires in particular coming from uh, Sri Lanka and around that area. Uh, and so there is um, an influx of, of, of jewels. And so these be, are used as for display in many different ways. Uh, and also there were a lot of jewels which were circulating on the market because during the surge of Protestantism in Northern Europe, um, many of the Roman Catholic reliquies were being melted and the jewels were then being traded. So um, many people, um, middle upper middle class merchants, as you see in this painting, would have had access to these um, large jewels, which they are exhibiting um, in their brooches. Now, this, um, the person we have here, again, painted by Veronese, um, this imposing fellow, um, you notice that they're all heavy, you know, this is important, he's leaning towards us and showing off, um, this is a large uncut emerald, which they think that they've actually found in one of the royal collections in Europe, uh, and which he gave to one of the uh, crowned heads of Europe as an uncut um, piece. So this then is, he didn't know much about uh, 
we know that he was someone who traded these. He wasn't an expert, but he traded. He opened up a company and would bring in all of these uncut jewels. But also, um, these jewels also um, had significance. You know, um, for example, this. I think if you actually look at this properly, it's actually supposed to be a sapphire. It looks green there, um, and sapphire. All of these jewels was uh, or gems were supposed to have um, magical. Um, properties as well. Um, for example, if you were wearing um, a sapphire and your husband was unfaithful to you, the, the sapphire went white. So ladies, check your sapphires. Um, other ones, um, emeralds were supposed to be useful in childbirth. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very much the same sort of um, idea of people being interested in crystals now, you know, crystals emanating mysterious qualities. So it's interesting at this time, then you have actually the sort of scientific, you know, mineralogy of the ancient world with these sort of um, new age type um, ideas about the importance of jewellery. I just wanted to show you this particular painting. Um, here, this woman is emphasising um, her jewels. I mean, it, um, you know, so much for the sumptuary laws, as you can see. Um, but this, of course, looks like a ruby to us, but it probably was a spinel. And spinels um, are <clears throat> jewels, uh, these crystals which are found often near rubies, um, but often come in different colours. Uh, and it was many of the great rubies of the world um, aren't really rubies at all, they're spinels. And in fact, the um, Prince of Wales ruby on the crown jewels of England isn't, isn't a ruby at all, it's a, it's a spinel. Um, and how could you tell whether it was a ruby or not? If you went to a jeweller, um, he could show you what he said is a real ruby, whereas in fact it was just another spinel or a garnet. So um, there was a, a lot of confusion about different styles. I'll have to quickly go th move through this. I just want to show you this woman um, wearing um, what would be considered very um, politically incorrect or economic, you know, from a humanitarian point of view. This is a stoat or an ermine, um, which was used, it's called a zibellino, and it was used um, to attract uh, fleas. Uh, and this poor stoat um, in the form of a stoat has had this beautiful jeweled head put on it. And sometimes you've got jeweled feet as well. And, and you can actually even buy them now over the internet, which I find disgusting. Now, the other thing which is really interesting here is this woman in the background. I mean, she's done up, she's got the, the pearl, she's got the brooch, um, and she's actually picking her teeth. Um, even in line with everybody else in the painting, she's got her mouth shut, even though she's picking her teeth. Um, by this time, um, um, toothpicks were a little bit out of date, and it's not quite sure why he was actually putting this in. But um, people um, picked their teeth, or the aristocrats did, and it was a piece of jewellery. And here you have one which is in the Victoria and Albert Museum, made into the form of um, a mermaid with beautiful um, enamel work here, jewels, and of course a very large pearl. Um, and a pick uh, or a sharp point here and here. And this um, it meant that the aristocrats had much worse teeth than the people because they ate um, sweetmeats and um, food that actually had sugars and so on. But also they picked their teeth and scraped them so that they, you can tell an aristocrat's teeth because the enamel has been scraped off. Um, here you have a, um, a lady sporting this um, around her neck with um, strands of pearls, pearls in her, oh, sorry, pearls in her hair. Um, also look at the rings to show that she, making sure that she pointing to her jeweled toothpick, but also the fact she's got rings on this part of her finger, showing that she obviously is not someone who could ever do any work because let's face it, uh, when you're grating the carrots, that would actually get in the way. Um, now, um, I think I'll have to sort of move on from, from here. That was, that was actually looking at the brocades. I just want to now very quickly look at the animals that you actually have um, in the paintings and how they also have symbolic meanings. Uh, the dogs that you saw in the front, right centre front, and these, let me see if I can go back to there, you'll notice that they are again in line uh, with the lamb, with Christ, uh, and with the vanitas um, 
Sorry, I've, I've gone. There we go. Um, here we have the two the two dogs. Now they're um, roped or tethered together, uh, and one of them um, is at the banquet. And this is again this you know the way in which we are tethered to the um, real world and searching for the divine. And um, this dog here is gnawing on a bone and he can't see anything else. He's having a great time with a bone, whereas this particular dog um, is straining on his leash and looking at directly at the miracle which is taking place with the wine being poured um, out of the water. So in other words, he um, is aware, um, he's pointing towards the miracle that takes place. And indeed it is the people who are involved in the miracle or the, the one, the life that is enrolled in the miracle are the dogs and the servants. The people who are the, the guests don't seem to have noticed um, really what is going on. So these two dogs would, would be sort of hunting dogs. Um, and there is at this time in Venice and particularly in Venetian art, um, there is an emphasis, I mean, so many of, of Venetian scenes have a dog in it. And I, at one stage, I was thinking I was going to write something on this. And then I looked up the internet and I found that it's already been done. But, you know, you could actually go through the churches of Venice and, and pick out in every painting, there's some form of a dog doing something, you know, right down from some Rocco um, downwards. So there are these, these hunting dogs. Then also over in the corner over here, we have um, another very, very large dog sitting next to the bridegroom. Now this is to um, assert the masculinity uh, of the bridegroom, um, showing that he's sort of someone who is going to protect his, his wife. Um, he's also someone wealthy enough to have one of these hounds. But the other thing that's very interesting is that on the bridegroom's lap is a tiny little spaniel. This is a papillon um, that doesn't have the, you know, the butterfly, which is now called, it's now called a butterfly. Uh, and it's been bred to have very pointy ears here. It doesn't have the pointy ears. It's one of those toy spaniels, which was, um, depicted very much in Venetian paintings of the time, tiny, delicate little, little thing. And it is to show the other side of, of the bridegroom. You know, he might be wealthy and he might be sort of a macho hunter, but he's also someone who is able to nurture um, and look after the weak um, and, you know, in many ways, the next, uh, you know, his children. Um, there's the little dog. Um, and of course, another one is, is seen over here. And Veronese uses these dogs, not just symbolically, um, but also to animate the painting. Uh, it's, um, the details of this painting are, are quite extraordinary. You know, you've got these wonderful sort of settings. You've got, you know, there's this man here is supposed to be the Holy Roman Emperor and there's a dog walking along uh, uh, in front of him. Uh, and this little dog, it's the same dog that you see in Titian's uh, Venus of Urbino. Um, this, of course, was a painting which was supposed to be over the marriage bed um, to give people the idea of what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, and here you actually have this little dog, which refers to sort of fidelity uh, and, and sweetness and gentleness uh, and so on. And also, of course, they were used to, to you know, detract from the fleas. I also want to show another Titian painting. Here we have the um, Vendramin brothers, uh, nine of whom are actually venerating the Holy Cross. And these little boys are sort of not all that interested in the Holy Cross. And this little one here is his little toy dog and the little dogs looking out of the painting, um, which animates the painting and sort of brings us into it as well. So um, it is one of the ones that you, you know, uh, aspects that uh, Veronese uses. And here he has a dog, Veronese, going back to the painting we're looking at, a dog's peering out of the upper balcony. Um, this is just a nod to those of you, particularly Judith, um, who loves Carpaccio as much as I do. Um, remember in the uh, cycle of St. Jerome, this gorgeous little dog who is the little dog who is 
the only person in this particular painting to have understood um, the meaning um, that St. Jerome um, is appearing to St. Augustine. You also have cats. Uh, you have the exotic nature of the, um, the parrot as well, and the parrot appears. Now, music in Venice. Now, um, many of you have, have, have sat through a lecture on the orphan choirs, but some of you haven't, um, and some of you who have been to Venice with me will, will know this, we have been to these places. Um, there are two references here to music. So you have the painters themselves, um, you know, there's this reference to painting as, as uh, sophisticated as music, you know, the, the arts, glorification of the arts, but also up here you have a choir who would have been singing and a lute player. So the, Venice was one of the important centres um, of uh, music. So we've looked at this before. With, there are the um, other people playing the music above. I just wanted to say that um, music and theatre um, blossomed in the 17th century. So this is all more or less about the same time. Um, our painting is 1563. Um, the, a little bit later, the um, theatres are going to be um, built around Venice and they are built uh, by the aristocratic families. By this stage, the aristocratic families have taken on um, an important role in um, the arts, um, but also in looking after uh, uh, orphans, uh, looking after the destitute. Uh, it was a sort of a, a, a kind of health system um, that didn't really exist anywhere else. Now, I wanted to talk in particular about the four orphan um, churches uh, that, uh, that spring up in Venice. This is the Pietà uh, on the Riva del Schiavone. Uh, is it Schiavone? Yes, it is here. Here's the Greci here, uh, the leaning tower of the Church of the Greeks. And in fact, if you're into Donna Leon, of course, this is where Inspector Brunetti uh, hangs out behind here. Um, now, these um, uh, four churches um, with the delightful names of Pietà, piety, I suppose, isn't too bad, but you have the, the beggars, the mendicanti, you have the derelicts, the derelitti, and you have the incurables, you know, it's sort of quite an address to be able to boost. Uh, they took in orphans um, of the plagues and orphans of the many wars uh, that Venice was engaged in. Um, and they brought in men, at least little boys, as well as, as girls. But eventually, by the time that in the 17th century, they were well known in particular um, for their um, production of music uh, through the girls in the orphanage. Now, the boys were taught a trade. <clears throat> the girls were then separated into those who were musical and those who weren't. Those who weren't were taught uh, lace work or uh, useful um, household uh, chores uh, and were given a dowry and it meant that they could marry. If you didn't have a dowry, you, of course, ended up having to be a prostitute. And the girls who were musically inclined were then trained to an incredibly high level. And they were trained also in um, musical instruments. In fact, the best musical instruments in Europe were created for these people, the, the best lutes, the best viola da gamba, uh, and the best, the, the uh, families who set these um, church institutions up um, vied with each other for um, being, a, being able to employ the, the best uh, composers, one of whom will be Vivaldi, as we'll see. Now, these girls um, were then dedicated to um, their profession, and uh, Vivaldi will actually uh, write music oratorios uniquely for these female voices. And you would, there's one great one by Vivaldi called The Triumph of Judith, uh, three of, uh, Judith Triomphans, where it's written in four parts for, uh, as you would with normal um, 
with men, you'd have a bass and a tenor and so on. He's managed to lower all of this for the female voices and you have four different levels of female voices singing. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, and they would be accompanied by um, the, the sister orphans on the uh, musical instruments. And in fact, most of them played several music instruments themselves. So this was a very, very exhausting regime that they were put through. Um, the, um, they weren't allowed to be seen. And so they would sing behind these uh, grills. Uh, um, well, not grills, what are they called? Um, well, the kind of sort of fretwork balconies and um, at four different points of the church. And so people would come in uh, and people throughout Europe, the great heads of Europe, people, tourists, people would come to Venice um, to hear the orphan choirs. And there was great competition in the newspaper be saying, I heard Marie Louise from the derelicts today and she's not as good as, as Sophia from the Pietà uh, and so on. Now, these girls uh, could marry. Um, they were given a very, very high um, uh, dowry. Um, but once they left and, and married, they were not allowed to perform. Um, if they did, they had to relinquish their dowry. They couldn't even perform at soirees. So in other words, the cachet that they brought to their institution would disappear with them and other girls would stay on. Those who didn't marry uh, would become teachers. I think Jean-Jacques Rousseau actually managed to catch a glimpse of them and he said it's one of the biggest disappointments in my life, these amazing voices and you see these plain little frumps um, up there behind the, um, uh, the fretwork here. Now some of you have been with me um, up here. This is Vivaldi who uh, spent most of his life um, working for the Pietà and uh, writing for these girls choirs. This of course is the what is now the a hospital, but this is um, Saint, the hospital of, of the uh, Mendicanti. Remember, we always used to walk across this bridge. Uh, and just near there, you have the derelicts. <laughs> and inside the derelicts, um, we also went in there. Um, in fact, two of the tours we've managed to get into the, here. You can see opposite what this looked like. And this is from a picture taken from what it looked like if you were actually one of the singers. Now, this is a very, very small um, auditorium. Uh, and so only an absolute elite would be allowed to come and hear these um, amazing voices. Um, so um, let's go back then to this painting. Um, I think that you can see that uh, what uh, Veronese has attempted to show is the extraordinary show of luxury and the sort of extraordinary civilization or society of Venice that you have at the time. So at, at, on one point, it's an advertisement and a glorification of the city itself and a glorification of its link to um, Christ. Uh, Venice being born on the day that Christ was conceived. So, however, all of the extraordinary material culture, the extravagance, the glamour, the elegance, sophistication of this city is really uh, only something which masks the essential message um, of the painting and of existence. And the real message is the stillness of Christ uh, alone in time and space and light um, about knowing that he will be sacrificed um, for these people to realize that it is all vain and that the meaning of life is through Christ and through the church. And so this would be what the monks would be concentrating on as they ate. Uh, their not too frugal repast, looking at the triviality, I suppose, or the unreality of the real world and answering Christ's call um, to a greater life. 
And I just wanted then to finish with this wonderful view of St. Giorgio Maggiore, where this was, was housed, and the glory of Venice, which really is represented uh, in the painting. So thank you very much.